This is a lecture on differential biochemical tests for the week of April 12, 2020. And so one thing that a biochemical test can do is to contribute to the profile of an unknown organism and help to identify it. And so usually we will combine data from gram staining, from morphology, from differential and selective media, as well as these biochemical tests, which we'll talk about in this lecture today, to create a profile or a biochemical profile of an unknown bacterium um, and then identify it from that. And one tool that we use to identify an unknown bacteria from this biochemical profile is known as a dichotomous key. And you can see one here on the right hand side. And usually starting with the gram stain results, positive or negative, you can see that there's two branch points from each of these different biochemical or selective media or morphology questions. And by following this pathway through the dichotomous key from the very top to the very bottom, we can identify unknown organisms. And so the first biochemical test that we're going to talk about today is the catalase test. And the catalase test is a really simple test. Um, catalase is an enzyme that converts hydrogen peroxide, or H2O2, into water and oxygen gas. And so this test is used to determine whether a bacteria produces this enzyme catalase. And it's really simple. So you take a bacteria, you mix it with hydrogen peroxide, and then you look for the presence of bubbles. So any bacteria that produces catalase will be able to convert the hydrogen peroxide into H2O and oxygen gas, and we'll see bubbles. And so here you can see the results of a catalase test. And what I mean by bubbles can be seen on the top slide here, as well as in the right-hand test tube. And so you can see a large amount of oxygen gas being produced by the catalase that's in these bacterial samples. And so these would be deemed catalase positive. If you don't see any production of gas bubbles or O2 gas, as you see in the bottom slide, or in the left-hand test tube, uh, those organisms would be considered catalase negative. And so this next test, this oxidase test, is used to determine the presence of an enzyme called oxidase in different types of enterobacteria. And so we have talked about in lecture that bacteria use electron transport chains, like this one on the right, to produce ATP during aerobic respiration or respiration that requires oxygen. And so in some bacteria, there's an electron carrier you can see in the center here, known as cytochrome C. And then there's an additional enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase, which oxidizes the cytochrome C and basically takes its electrons from it and then passes it down the line to the next member of the electron transport chain. And so what an oxidase test does is determine whether a bacteria has that oxidase enzyme or not. And the way that it does that is by using what's known as an artificial electron acceptor and looking for a color change. And so what the oxidase can do is turn this artificial electron acceptor, dimethyl p phenyl enidamine, from colorless to bluish purple. And so in the presence of oxidase, you'll see a purple color change, much like this up here. And so these filter paper discs have been impregnated with this artificial electron acceptor. And then the bacteria has been swiped onto the top of the filter paper using a cotton swab. And you can see that there's a dark purple color change in, on the filter paper on the left and no color change in the one on the right. And so we would consider this purple to be oxidase positive and this no color change to be oxidase negative because the oxidase positive bacterium has the enzyme it needs to convert the artificial electron acceptor from colorless to purple in this reaction down here. So you see a color change. Oxidase tests can also be done on what's known as a dry slide. And this is what you're going to use in your virtual oxidase test module. And so the dry slide is basically pieces of filter paper 
cut into squares and then arranged into quadrants. And they're also impregnated with this same artificial electron acceptor so that when you swipe or um, swab your bacterial samples onto the dry slide, you'll see either no color change for an oxidase negative bacteria or purple color change for an oxidase positive. So the next test I'm going to talk about is the starch hydrolysis test, and it differentiates between organisms based on their ability to break down or hydrolyze starch. And starch is a really big and bulky molecule. And so in order to digest starch, bacteria have to secrete exoenzymes or those exterior enzymes out into the media around them to digest the starch because they can't do it from the inside. And so what's important to remember is that you can see an uninoculated starch auger plate at the top and then two different types of bacteria growing on it in these two plates below. Um, there's no color change or way to differentiate while the bacteria are growing on starch auger. Everything happens after you add another reagent, and that reagent is iodine. And so iodine gets added to starch auger plates after the bacteria have had a chance to grow. And what that results in is a reaction that turns the plate, even when uninoculated, into a dark blue, purple, or black color. So you can see the black color up here. However, when there are bacterial samples, you can then use this um, color change to look for hydrolysis of starch. And so in the bottom, you can see uh, this bacteria was able to grow on a starch auger plate. Iodine was added, and it looks almost exactly the same as it did before. But when you look at this plate here, you can see that there's this zone of clearing all around the outside of the bacterial lawn. And that clearing shows where the starch has been broken down and hydrolyzed, and therefore the iodine can't bind to it. And that remains clear, or in this case, kind of this red color. And so any clearing around a bacterial lawn is read as a starch hydrolysis positive result. Whereas if there's no clearing like this plate on the bottom, it would be read as starch negative. Just to kind of show you another example of that, this clearing is a little bit even more evident around the bacterial lawn. So once again, bacteria can grow on both starch positive and starch negative plates, right? So you can see the lawns here, but what you're really looking for for positive or negative is that clearing around the bacterial lawn. And that clearing here would indicate this organism is um, starch positive and this one on the right is starch negative. The next test that we're going to talk about is the citrate test and it differentiates based on the ability of an organism to use citrate as a source of carbon for energy. And citrate tests are really helpful for differentiating between different types of enterobacteria. And so the simmon citrate auger slant that you can see here is normally green in color. It contains um, an ammonium compound called ammonium dihydrogen phosphate, as well as bromothymol blue pH indicator, which is what gives it that green color at a neutral pH. And organisms that are able to use citrate as a carbon source can metabolize this ammonium compound into ammonia which is a very basic molecule, and turn this media alkaline or basic, which results in a color change from green to blue. So citrate positive organisms will have this royal blue color <laughs> because of the basic pH of the media, whereas citrate negative organisms will um, have this green color. And the last test we're going to talk about is a urease test. Urease is also an exoenzyme, just like um, the enzymes required to hydrolyze starch, but its job is to convert urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. And so a urease test is simply done to determine whether a bacteria produces urease or it doesn't. Um, and many enteric bacteria or bacteria that live in your gut and intestines do produce urease um, because those environments are very high in urea and having urease allows them 
to degrade that urea effectively. Um, but only enteric bacteria that can really degrade that urea quickly will appear urease positive. And that's because urease broth is designed to have very minimal nutrients. And so if they can't convert that urea in the time it takes to eat up those nutrients, they'll show up as urease negative, even though they might technically be able to, um, they might technically have urease in them. And so what this test really differentiates between is super fast urease activity and um, bacteria that um, produce urease at much lower levels. And so an uninoculated urease broth looks um, like this picture here. There's urea in that broth and there's phenol red pH indicator, which is sort of this like rusty orange color. And then in the presence of the urease enzyme, urea is converted into ammonia, which is a very basic compound. And then that basic or alkaline compound turns urea, turns the phenol red indicator bright pink. And that would be read as a urease positive result. Bacteria that don't have urease enzyme would not be able to convert the urea into ammonia. This medium would become acidic and the color would turn yellow, and that would indicate a urease negative organism. And so urease positives are bright pink, and urease negatives are yellow.